Dr. Kimball, I'm just going to show a case I did a few months ago just to illustrate my current technique in a moderately dense nucleus case. I would call this trench divide and conquer because I do like to sculpt a central groove. Others have given different names to what we originally described. In really dense lenses, I like to carve out a crater, get rid of a lot of the dense central nucleus. But in moderately dense, as you see here, with still a, a good pink reflex, then just the central groove, which I call a trench, and then divide and take multiple segments. You can see there's a lot of twitching of this eye under topic line of seizure. And sometimes we have to be patient until the patient settles down a little bit and, and be careful. You can see I wouldn't want to do capsulorexis without stabilizing this eye. And sometimes you have to stabilize it for more than capsulorexis. You see, I did stabilize it for the paracentesis, which I always do anyway. This is a fine Thornton ring that I use to stabilize. Making a very shallow groove right at the limbus so that I can start my incision deep at the limbus. Try to get it about as long as it is wide. And we have to put a lot of pressure here. Be careful not to get a meniscus of fluid there from the fine Thornton ring that can throw you off as to far as far as where you are in your capsular rexus just because of the, the reflection of the light through fluid. If necessary, I use a uh, a cellular eye wick, it's called, to promote drainage from the sulcus in deep set eyes, or from the fornix, I should say. For hydrodissection, I like to start sub incisionally right under the capsule with just pulses until I see the fluid wave under the lens and then I press down and pull a little bit toward the center to loosen the equatorial part of the lens from the capsule. A little more irrigation now until I can get that rotation, easy rotation of the lens to make sure that the that the lens is free. The patient's head has moved a lot so we didn't have it taped down, so I had to readjust the head and then center the microscope again. And now proceeding with adding some little bit of cohesive OVD. First was dispersive, and now this co bit of cohesive OVD creates a little bit of a, a dome to the dispersive so that uh, lens fragments don't stick in it as much. And also, it's... Uh, gives the immediate flow of fluid because the cohesive OVD will aspirate quickly as you turn on your aspiration, irrigation aspiration, and you don't have a block of inflow like you can with a cohesive OV, I mean a dispersive OVD to get wound burn. I like to have the second instrument in the eye as soon as I start uh, phacoemulsification. 
And you can see now I'm nudging and stabilizing the lens and just nudging it a little bit away once we get a trough. I don't go to the equator with my sculpting necessarily. And there's the first fracture. And it's only about halfway through, but we can start removing a lens segment with just a partial separation like that. If we make a small uh, section to be removed. I don't like four quadrant because the the sections are so big they don't come into the the center as easily as the small segments do. And you get less uh, loss of the tissue past the phaco tip. Now I'm completing the fracture and because I like to always remove rotating clockwise, stabilizing the the larger remaining part with the hook, and this is a Hefliger hook made by Moria. I like it because your chopping device does not have to be real long and this is uh, shorter and yet it's long enough for most lenses. If you have a real thick dense lens then I'll go to a Seibel or Connor wand to be able to get behind the thicker capsule but can see this fractures very easily. So for most cases I've, I like this uh, this uh, chopper device. You can see I like to make very small segments because they come to the tip with less loss of the fragments floating up to the cornea. So we still have partial segment there and we can rotate it clockwise if it'll go. If it doesn't, sometimes counterclockwise until you get it in the position to where you can stabilize the remaining part with your second instrument and then just chop off the smaller segments to emulsify. can see how there has been no fragment coming up anywhere close to the cornea. Most of the fake emulsification and the energy is dissipated down below the plane of the iris. So that reduces the trauma to the corneal endothelium. One can switch to lower uh, vacuum levels here, but if it's a stable chamber, I can just titrate it back to less energy and, and vacuum with the foot switch and don't always switch down to the epinuclear settings. Notice I'm protecting posterior capsule, even though we have good instruments now that reduce surge I still like to keep that second instrument under the tip and look for fragments that are stuck by the paracentesis or the main incision before coming out with the phaco tip and adding more lidocaine while the scrub nurse is changing to the IA tip. This is a habit because in long cases you'll find that the patients uh, start to feel more by the time you're finished, even if it isn't a half hour case. But particularly in long cases I like to add the lidocaine every five minutes or so.
Also at this time, the nurses are placing more marcaine is what we use on the surface. While there is outflow from the anterior chamber, I find it safe then to put your topical anesthetic that has some uh, preservative in it because the scrub nurse is going to irrigate the remaining off and there will be none that gets into the eye to be toxic. So we remove the lens epithelial cells and unfortunately not edited in here I also turned down to a vacuum of five and very low flow rate as well and vacuum the posterior capsule routinely. Thank you for your attention.